Uh, Your Excellency, the President of Ghana, Honourable former Prime Minister, respected experts, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this wonderful event. Uh, my name is Jamil Andalini. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Politico Europe. Uh, I um, have spent a little bit of time in Asia myself. I spent uh, my whole adult life, actually, 22 years in China uh, as a journalist. And now I live in Brussels, so a little bit of culture shock for me. But uh, it's my uh, great honor to be your MC and your moderator for today's event. Uh, this is the inaugural Paris Asia Society, Asia Society France event. And it marks the expansion of this amazing network to now 14 great cities around the world. It could not be a more important moment with war raging in Europe with the global economy in turmoil and tensions at boiling point in Asia. I'd like to, without further ado, introduce uh, Serge Dumont, an old friend of mine. We last saw each other for dinner in Hong Kong, was the last time I saw you, I think. But uh, I'd like to ask Serge uh, to uh, come and uh, give some introductory remarks. Serge is the chairman and co-founder of the Asia Society France. And uh, please, Serge. Well, <clears throat> first of all, Jamil, I'd like to thank you for being here because I understand you just flew in from Washington, D.C. and had to go on a motorcycle from the airport to here. So we're really grateful. That's really what I call commitment. Thank, thank you. Excellency, the President of the Republic of Ghana, Dear Kevin, Excellencies, dear friends of Asia Society and Asia Society France, you can imagine my emotion standing here today in front of you all for the global launch of Asia Society France. In this beautiful 13th century Cistercian building, renowned to be a space of freedom, which invite, invites us to look at the world through different eyes to better understand it. It is a tremendous honor to have you with us today, Mr. President. We are humbled by your presence, given your role as an African and a global leader. We are also very grateful for the presence of the Honorable Kevin Rudd, the President of Asia Society and one of the world's most distinguished experts on China. While the 20th Congress of the Chinese Communist Party will take place in a few days. Your visit to Paris, dear Kevin, is most timely and in line with what Asia Society France has adopted as a motto, shed light, not heat. Let me also take this opportunity to thank Asia Society France's trustees for their generous support. All the Asia Society trustees and thank all of you on behalf of our organizations for coming from many places from around the world, from the United States, from Korea, from Japan, from Hong Kong, from the UK, from Switzerland. This is the uniqueness and the richness of Asia society, which offers insights on Asia and the world from so many different perspectives. Our gratitude also goes to the fantastic speakers who also come from every corner of the world, including New Zealand, India, Japan, Ghana, Italy, Cyprus, and of course, France. And they have all kindly accepted to be part of this adventure, which wouldn't be the same without them. So thank you. The youngest of them, you'll be happy to know, is in her early 20s. And we are very proud to have this unique pool of talents spirits and knowledge with us today. It is quite a privilege. Thank you also to Bluebell, Paneco, Politico and Jean, our partners, without whom the organization of this exceptional day of thought-provoking conversations couldn't have happened. And thank you to our fantastic, small but mighty organizing team led by Valérie, who put all this together. Last but definitely not least, thank you all, dear members of the audience, for supporting our mission and goals and for being here today. And remember, 
that we will also have fascinating conversations this afternoon, so please stick around after lunch. The future of the world cannot be thought of without Asia, but it can equally not be thought of without Europe, which is today under strain, but remains an ideal of peace and prosperity. It is our honor and our mission to be able to contribute to strengthening their link and open new lines of communications and dialogue. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Serge. And now I'd like to ask uh, former Prime Minister of Australia, uh, the Honourable Kevin Rudd, to make some remarks. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, uh, distinguished members of the diplomatic corps who are with us today here at the Collège uh, de Bernardin, uh, trustees of the Asia Society, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Serge Dumont said something important just now. Uh, he said, uh, we cannot contemplate a future for the 21st century uh, in the absence of Asia. And that is because the center of geopolitical gravity has moved uh, to Asia. The center of geoeconomic gravity has moved to Asia. Although the ancient civilizations and cultures of Asia have been permeating across the world now for millennia. But Serge also said something else important. Um, the world in its 21st century future is not simply the sound of one hand clapping, and that is Asia. It is always the sound of two hands clapping, and that is Asia and the rest of the world. Uh, whether it is uh, what is quaintly called in this continent the West, um, uh, the East having been defined as a concept in the West, because it was East of the West, um, and our European friends should reflect on the fact that the East long existed before there was a West, uh, but for the rest of the world as well. And we are, in that respect, members of a global society, a global community, enriched by the enormous contributions of uh, all cultures and civilizations, those of Africa, those of Latin America, those of the Americas writ large, those of Asia in all their diversity, uh, and those of um, uh, this great and extraordinary continent called Europe. The Asia Society, since its inception in 1956, which I'm pleased to say was before I was born, uh, has had a mission for the last 66 years, two-thirds of a century, uh, to find pathways through the enormous complexities of differences of culture, civilization, and perspective uh, across the different countries of Asia those of the United States, and across the world. As the Asia Society, we have been hard at work on this over several generations. We have sought to build this institution to become a global network, not simply an American institution, which it is no longer. It is a global network. We have centers now in um, Seoul, in Tokyo, uh, in Hong Kong, in Southeast Asia, in Sydney, in Melbourne, in Delhi, uh, and in uh, Mumbai. We're also, of course, across the United States, in New York uh, and in Washington, in Houston, in Los Angeles, in, South in San Francisco. And in recent years, uh, we have uh, now opened in Zurich and today here in La Belle France. So we see ourselves very much legitimately as a global institution. We are run by global trustees, um, and uh, our family and board of governance is drawn from across the world. We are now some 250 staff. We are strongly committed to the important role of arts and culture as forging links between communities across the world, even in times of geopolitical tension. Uh, we are also, however, a think tank and a do tank. And we have become, in the United States, one of the largest uh, think tanks specializing on Asia and one of the largest think tanks specializing on China. 
Our mission throughout those two-thirds of a century and the decades that have evolved since the height of the first Cold War and what appears to be, to the regret of many of us, the beginning of a second, has been to try and identify shared futures and shared pathways between the countries of the world. And nowhere is that uh, more important than in the extraordinarily complex terrain of the relationship now between China and the United States and between China and the rest of the world. And it's in that great challenge that we as a think tank and as an institution have been deeply involved. Recently, um, we produced a book entitled The Avoidable War. I didn't think uh, I'd ever have to write a book entitled The Avoidable War between China and the United States. Regrettably, it's become necessary because geopolitical tensions have now reached such a level of accentuation that we must think about how we construct exit ramps, other possibilities, ways of preventing total catastrophe, which would ensue from a war between the world's largest economy and the world's second largest economy, between the world's largest military and the world's second largest military. So why have we come to France? Taking the car here this morning, uh, I was reminded again of what an extraordinarily beautiful city this is. My wife and I have spent so much time in Paris uh, throughout our married life that sometimes it's easy to forget, particularly in the long years of COVID, how remarkable this city is. It is truly a centre of great elegance, but it's also a city and a culture of great intellectual distinction. And therefore, the tradition in France on the questions of Sinology and the broader study of Asia is at least three to 400 years old. The contributions to Sinology, my own field of study, by great uh, French Sinologists is known throughout the academy. And therefore, and when I look at the broader study of Asia, whether it's on Japan or South Asia or Southeast Asia, uh, this is a home of great scholarship and of great uh, intellectual uh, refinement but also a city and a country which has long revered the aesthetic traditions of the East. In the contemporary world, um, there can be no proper global discourse on the future of US and China or the future of Asia and the world in the absence of France. France is a global power. France is a permanent member of the uh, UN Security Council. France is active right across Francophonie. France is active in most uh, theatres in the world. It is very much an Indo-Pacific power. Uh, French territories lie in uh, that region. Therefore, as we, extend to, as we extend our operations to engage in a global discourse about how do we preserve the peace, how do we sustain development, and how do we sustain the planet, it's important, therefore, for this discourse not, to be, not simply to be a trans-Pacific discourse, but to be a transatlantic and, in fact, a global discourse. And so that is why we are here in France. And we have come at the invitation of our new board of uh, French trustees. And we look very much forward to building this institution in the future with your help. We don't claim to have a unique expertise in the Asia Society, nor in the Asia Society Policy Institute, nor in our recently launched Centre for China Analysis. But what we seek to do is this. We believe that to find a way through the world's current grave challenges, whether it's on climate or the rest, in classical geopolitics, the, the beginning of wisdom lies in understanding how the other side thinks and why they think that way. Too much analysis in the United States, where I live and work, uh, is, makes a series of assumptions about how the countries of Asia should think without actually understanding that they may think differently. And I think the same applies elsewhere in the world. So one of our distinguishing features as an Asian society is that we seek not simply to describe and assume an American worldview, or for that matter, a European worldview. Our mission is to understand the worldview of the countries and civilizations and the current polities of Asia as well. We may not agree with the current stated views of the Chinese Communist Party on X, Y, and Z, A, B, and C. We have a responsibility to understand them. Uh, because understanding it uh, is the beginning of wisdom and working out a way through. 
Our second distinguishing feature through our think tank operations is that when we analyze, for example, uh, the views of the region and the views within China, we do so by returning always to the primary documents in language. That is, what is the internal discourse of these countries? What is the internal discourse within the Chinese Communist Party as we move towards the 20th Party Congress? Too often this is now left to one side as if it's irrelevant. It's not. The internal discourse of all the, these countries is important because it shapes the reality as perceived from the capitals of Asia. And so we place, place an enormous priority in understanding the internal political discourse within each of these countries. Our final distinguishing feature um, is that we seek to be um, robustly objective, not captive to a single government's view or a single political culture's view, because there's too much of that already. We seek to actually bring together, where we can, a synthesis of views. The argument I often use in relation to the current study of China is this. When I reflect on the United States, there is no lack of analysis, but there is a poverty of synthesis in bringing together the various strands of China-related knowledge into an analysis and a conclusion which is useful for policymakers around the world. Too often we'll have an expert on nuclear arms control who has no understanding of the internal operations of the Chinese Communist Party. Too often we'll have experts in Japanese security policy who will have no concept of what's actually happening within the LDP and the internal politics of Japan. Too often we'll have experts on the, on the Sino-Indian border who have none, no understanding of the different traditions of security policy with the BJP and the Congress Party within India. Our job is to understand these complexities and where we can to synthesise them. My final point uh, as we move towards uh, the opening of this um, new chapter in our institution's history is to reflect on how this Asia Society France Centre will build bridges also uh, to our friends in Africa. It's been my great privilege as Prime Minister of Australia and also Foreign Minister to have spent much time on the continent. Uh, I've travelled widely in Africa, including uh, Your Excellency to Ghana, and I have spent many a fun time in Accra. Um, there can be no discourse on uh, the future of our planet without a parallel discourse uh, on the future of Africa. Africa is an unfolding story of great opportunity and, of course, parallel to that, enormous challenges. And therefore, what we can do through this centre here in Paris to build the bridge of understanding, to understand, for example, within Africa how perspectives on China's rise may not be viewed in the same lens as they are viewed either in uh, Washington or, for that matter, in Paris. That's the complexity in which we engage uh, as a think tank. So whether we are in um, the countries of uh, Anglophone Africa or Francophone Africa or the rest of Africa, these perspectives are also important to us. And given France's remarkable connection uh, with uh, African Francophonie, we see this as a, an important bridge uh, to uh, our understanding of the evolution of the continent and its own different perspectives on the emerging challenges across Asia and between Asia and the West. So in summary, that is why we're here. That is the institution we are and the culture we represent as an Asia society. Uh, that is uh, the reason why we find ourselves here in Paris today with the opening of this um, uh, Asia Society France Centre. And that is why we are so honoured to have with us today the President of Ghana to be part of our initial launch uh, ceremonies. So with those remarks, uh, could I say something very simple? Uh, it's with uh, great pleasure and with uh, some degree of uh, honour and distinction uh, that I officially declare open Asia Society France. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Ghana is a beacon of stability in Africa. And I, I've been told that uh, you received uh, this week an honorary doctorate from the Sorbonne, which is a, a great honor. I, I hope uh, 
um, you, you appreciate, and that's wonderful. And I'd like you now. Uh, I'd like now to uh, invite you, President of the Republic of Ghana, uh, to give some remarks. Thank you so much. Ghana's Minister for Foreign Affairs and members of the Ghanaian delegation, the President of the Asia Society, the President of the Asia Society France, members of the Diplomatic Corps, ladies and gentlemen. When the Asia Society was created in 1956, in the aftermath of the Korean War, its founders wanted to believe in a world where dialogue could prevail over division, a world that could learn lessons from the tragedies of the Second World War, a world where knowledge of the other and intercultural understanding would make it possible to overcome what the great Lebanese writer, Amin Malouf, would later call murderous identities. This world, alas, has not come to pass. Does this mean that the founders of the Asia Society were wrong and that the very purpose of the institution is outdated? I do not think so. On the contrary, I believe that it has never been so important or so pressing. That is why I'm happy to be here with you for the launch of Asia Society France which aims to be a force for dialogue, when dialogue has never been so urgent. In this, your organization is in keeping with the very essence of what France represents, a nation that has put balance and reason at the heart of its national project. In September 2000, when the world's heads of state and government met in New York, for the Millennium Assembly, the belief in globalization was at its height. OECD countries were enjoying robust and sustained growth. Emerging economies, especially in Asia, were catching up fast after the 1997 crisis. International trade was in full swing. Global conflict was diminishing after the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War, and democratic aspirations were gaining new vigor wherever they had been stifled. That world is no more. The collective dream has broken down. Almost everywhere, it has been replaced by national or even nationalistic dreams that threaten the stability of the world a stability achieved at the cost of so many sacrifices. A stable world is a world without winners or losers. It is a world that respects international law. It is a world of equity, where the strongest do not crush the weakest. I've lived long enough to know that any victory won through injustice, imposed not through fairness, but through violence and coercion, is a victory in the form of defeat. For the victor, for the vanquished, for global security, for humanity. That is why I repeat, whatever the fate of the arms, Ghana, my country, beacon of democracy and stability in contemporary Africa, vigorously condemns Russia's aggression against Ukraine a sovereign country. Ghana, the first country in sub-Saharan Africa to gain her freedom and independence from colonial bondage, in her case, British colonial rule, has been consistently committed to a vision of the world free from hege hegemonic practices in which all nations, great or small, live in peaceful coexistence in conditions of equity and mutual respect, and where differences in the international era, arena are settled by dialogue and negotiation and not by force and violence. 
I know that in the plenary session that follows this speech, you will address the critical issue of whether a new era of war, of wars, is avoidable today. As a man, I want to believe so. And as a head of state, I'm working relentlessly to this end. Because in an interdependent world, the consequences of what is happening in Mariupol or in Donbass affect the lives of hundreds of millions of my fellow Africans. Our continent, already sorely hit by the crisis born of the COVID pandemic, is suffering a shock of unprecedented violence that is jeopardizing the fruits of years of efforts to improve our economies. Worse, Africa is once again becoming a playing field for power rivalries as it was at the height of the Cold War. In West Africa, against a background of social crisis, this results in increased instability, a resurgence of terrorist acts, an acceleration of migratory pressures, which I would remind you, weigh primarily on the African countries themselves, and a questioning of the democratic model. How can we tackle all these problems at the same time when our continent, which is responsible for only a very small part of greenhouse gas emissions, is moreover the one most affected by climate change? As I said in my speech to the UN General Assembly last September, we do not have the luxury of being able to pick and choose which big problem to solve. Make no mistake, this war that threatens to spread is already a global conflict that is bringing to the brink of breakdown the international order inherited from the Second World War and the fall of communism. Today, nothing rules out the possibility of the worst happening. The nuclear threat poses a mortal danger to the whole of creation. I'm not afraid to say in this secular country of France that as a man of faith, I'm horrified by the threat of apocalyptic destruction to the whole of creation. What could be the prospects for development in a destroyed world? We must collectively think about the post-war period. And even if some will no doubt find it premature, think about reconciliation. Europe, as the gateway to Africa and Asia, had for decades projected an image of stability and prosperity. Today, it is returning to its old demons by becoming one of the most unstable areas in the world. This instability fundamentally compromises the development prospects of both Africa and Asia for both need a stable, prosperous, and supportive Europe capable of playing its full role as a responsible partner. We Africans and our fellow Asians have a common interest in ensuring that what is primarily a European crisis is resolved as soon as possible. Is it necessary to recall at this point that the European Union is China's main trading partner? as it is for a number of African countries, like Ghana. Alongside Africa, the major Asian countries, China, Indonesia, Japan, and India, the latter holding the presidency of the G7 and G20 in 2023, must harness their collective influence to stop this headlong rush to conflict and to repair or even rebuild the international order so that this situation can never be repeated and the international community can finally begin to deal with the real problems of our time. The fight against extreme poverty, access to water, climate change, and access to jobs and dignified living conditions for everyone, everywhere. Let me end on a would-be philosophical note. This, the situation we are experiencing also traces the limits of an intellectual framework that has been forged in the West since colonization, and that was built on relations of domination and force. 
in the grammar of our ancient African and ancient Asian civilizations, we do not think of the world solely in terms of domination, opposition, or predation. Our elders promoted the idea of wholeness, of balance, of the interdependence of man with his environment, of the interdependence of generations. I believe that this is a subject of one of the round tables that will take place here this afternoon. We do not want an anti or post-Western world. We want a world that is reconciled and united in its humanity in the face of the common challenges that determine beyond mere survival the desirable future that we want for ourselves and especially for our children. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I think uh, we've got a bit of time, so maybe um, uh, unless the president has to leave imminently, perhaps we could, uh, I could ask some questions um, of, of the, the group. Um, maybe, Serge, I'll start with you. Where, uh, when did you decide uh, with your co-founders to, uh, to launch this, and what, where, was the, where was the inspiration from? The idea, in fact, didn't come from me. I was involved with Asia Society in Hong Kong, as you know, and in New York for about a dozen years. So I had uh, you know, the experience of dealing with the remarkable activities that Asia Society was doing around the world. Uh, the idea came from uh, a number of global trustees who are here in the room, Duncan Clark, um, uh, Fris Demopoulos, and Thierry Porte. And uh, they, they thought rightly that uh, Europe and France needed to have a place in the global dialogue. Uh, and as Kevin mentioned in his remarks, it was absolutely necessary to bring a different viewpoint, uh, the European viewpoint, to the discussion. So when they approached me, I said, I mean, I'm very interested and I'm so glad we did. And I'm very grateful that Kevin and the board supported our initiative and, and I thank you for being here for the opening today. And uh, to uh, Mr. Former Prime Minister, um, uh, you and I have done events in uh, New York before, and uh, it's great to see you again. Um, something I, many of the audiences, I'm sure, very familiar with uh, Asia Society, but could you explain just briefly what is the relationship between all the, all the various branches, the cities, how, how it operates, uh, and, and your role in sort of as the umbrella. Master. Right, I've never seen myself as a parapluie, but there you go. <laughs> but I'm, well, I'm willing to start, you know. The, um, uh, before I answer that, can I just thank you, Mr. President, for your extraordinarily reflective remarks uh, at our opening. I valued them enormously. Uh, I'm a former political leader myself, and I know that there are two types of political leaders in the world. Um, those who read out speeches which you forget about about 45 seconds later, uh, and the one that we've just heard, which is quite different. And your reflections uh, on uh, the importance of understanding that uh, wisdom just does not lie uh, in a view based on domination, but also that there is a wisdom and a traditional African wisdom which lies in balance. I think should be themes which remain with us today in our reflections. So I thank you for the, ref the um, philosophical reflections of a man of faith. Uh, and here we are in the College des Bernardines. So it's fine, you're okay. <laughs> Even in secular France. <laughs> the, um, uh, as I said before about the Asia Society, and I will simply uh, add one or two quick thoughts. Uh, the institution uh, has uh, three pillars. Arts and culture, where we've been engaged for a long, long time. Hundreds of exhibitions of, uh, of Asian uh, uh, culture uh, in all the media, uh, both classical and modern, um, and not just in New York, but across the range of our institutions in Hong Kong, uh, in Houston, uh, where in all three centers we run significant museums of, uh, of, um, of Asian art. And we, as you've indicated before, Mr. President, we find cultural discourse 
when geopolitical co discourse breaks down. Cultural discourse often is our last remaining insurance against silence altogether. So for us, this is a continuing theme of that which we do. Our second uh, pillar is uh, education, where uh, we uh, provide uh, online Chinese language uh, services uh, to uh, American schools and to American students. And our simple view there is it's far better we have a generation of Americans who understand uh, the countries of Asia from the inside through the languages which are foundational to it. And the third pillar is that of a think tank, which I described in my earlier remarks. But as you said in your question, uh, we are a global network of now 15 centers. Um, and therefore, we see ourselves as offering an ability to leverage uh, the insights from each of those centers from now in Europe, across Asia, and across the United States on things which are of relevance today. To give you a couple of examples, from our California center, our Northern California center in San Francisco and in Silicon Valley, we are actively engaged in the debate about tech regulation in the United States, the, the emerging tech struggle slash war between China and the United States, and, and the implications for that for the economy, but also for broader international relations. In our Washington Center, uh, we are deeply engaged in the future of American free trade, or as the case at the moment, non-free trade, um, as America returns to some of its more protectionist traditions. And how do we crack open that for a wider American commercial engagement with the rest of the world? And our staff there are trade professionals. Uh, if I look to our center in India, our, uh, both in Mumbai and Delhi, there we seek to understand the evolving uh, construction of the quad uh, between uh, Japan, Australia, uh, India and the United States in rebalancing the newly arrived uh, geopolitical p power and influence of uh, China in the wider Indo-Pacific region. And finally, uh, when I look to our center in Tokyo, the enormous insights it's able to provide uh, in terms of the unfolding chapter of Japanese security policy uh, in uh, East Asia writ large. So we see ourselves as a family, um, bringing together traditions and insights from across uh, the global network. Uh, and when we convene, uh, we usually, uh, we often do not convene simply nationally as we are doing here today, but we will convene as an entire global network simultaneously uh, online uh, in order to produce uh, an integrated event where you'll have perspectives from across the world. So that's how we work. Um, what's my job in a lot of it? Yes, an umbrella. Um, that's, uh, I see myself as a parapluie for good weather and bad. And uh, Mr. President, um, I have uh, two questions for you. One uh, short and easy and one, two questions. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. You get two. That's, one is short that's and social justice. Is, uh, <laughs> one is short and easy, and one is a bit more uh, philosophical, if you like. Um, so the first one is, uh, w w could you see uh, an Asia society in Accra uh, any time in the, in the near future? That's an easy one, um, hopefully. Uh, and secondly, the topic of our next uh, panel is, is on the uh, avoidability of uh, war. Um, I wonder what you think the role of Ghana, but, but Africa as a whole, is in this new Cold War, which I happen to believe is already begun, and um, what, what role can statesmen in Africa like yourself, global leaders like yourself, uh, play in uh, avoiding such a terrible uh, outcome? Well, thank you. Well, first of all, yes, uh, an Asian society based in Ghana or wherever on the continent is clearly, clearly feasible. And in fact, in some ways, I think desirable. Uh, already, as I indicated in my speech, our biggest trading partner is China. It used to be necessarily, of course, the old colonial power, Britain. But today, the, the dynamics of our, of our international engagement is such that China is our biggest trading partner, even um, more important to us than the European Union. India is, I think, the third. 
So, so two of the most important nations in Asia are already deeply involved with Ghanaian life. So to have an organization in place which attempts to understand and uh, dis, uh, disseminate information about what is taking place in these countries was something that would be very beneficial to us. It's obvious. That is our fear. It's our greatest, uh, well, the contemporary responsibility, the biggest responsibility we have is to do whatever we can to prevent Africa from being yet again the breeding ground for these great power rivalries. It was our problem in the 19th century that led to the famous conference in Berlin where Disraeli and Bismarck and the other leaders of Europe stood around a, a map of Africa and pointed and drew a, a map and that became the source of uh, legitimizing colonization by one or other of their countries. It, we, it, 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 it was a, a major intervention in the lives of the African people. It had some positive aspects, but on the whole, I think that the, 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 the belong, as it were, was negative. We have to do everything in our part to prevent it from happening again. How that is done well, is obviously diplomacy and especially cohesion amongst us as Africans, and therefore, the importance of our regional and continental organizations, ECOWAS in the case of West Africa, SADC and the others, and the overall continental organization, the African Union. The more we can find uh, a way of articulating and defending the common positions that emerge from our deliberations at the, at the, at the level of the African Union, the greater chance we will have in trying to prevent what the moment is looking like almost something inevitable. I don't think it's inevitable because I always believe that political action properly directed can prevent and transform situations. And I think that that is what we're going to have to look at to see. I mean, West Africa at the moment, I mean, we're having a, uh, a, a, an intervention that has very, very serious consequences for us, and that is there's a Russian mercenary group. I don't know to what extent you're familiar with it here in Europe, called this Wagner Group, which is now very active in West Africa. Uh, it's active in Mali. It is attempting to extend its tentacles into Niger, into, into Burkina Faso, and ultimately, of course, uh, uh, make these staging posts for... Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's an unofficial way of spreading Russian influence in the area. We've had dealings with Russia before in its, in its form of the Soviet Union during the, the decolonization period. It was very positive relationships. But the, uh, a mercenary group that is coming to protect, especially military regimes, and that, that, it, that poses a lot of issues about, about, of an ethical nature, political immorality, issue, all kinds. But um, these, are, these are the developments that are taking place in West Africa. And we have to find a way of being able to try and, and halt this phenomenon. I'm going to press you one more. Since I'm a journalist, I'm going to take my uh, journalistic privilege. Um, you mentioned the Wagner Group, and it's something that we at Politico cover very closely. Um, we've also clo closely covered the, the battle for hearts and minds, if you like. And uh, my impression coming from Asia to, to Europe is that many people here just assume that the rest of the world, Africa, Latin America, Asia, agrees with uh, Brussels or agrees with Paris and Berlin that Russia is the the evildoer, Russia is the in the wrong and uh, what we've found out and we've noticed is that in fact in many parts of the world there is not much sympathy for Ukraine or not much sympathy for the position of the European Union and we even hear you know this is America's war even in Europe actually in some quarters we hear this is America pro uh, provoked to the point where Putin couldn't do anything else and this is a uh, this is America's war on the Kremlin and Europe and Africa have to pay for it um, how do you think the West is doing when it comes to the hearts no, and minds I, of Africa? I, uh, I don't accept this as being in somebody's war. I mean, it's obvious. Uh, first of all, at the, at the diplomatic level, the majority of African states were emphatic in their support of the resolution of the, the General Assembly condemning uh, the, uh, the, uh, the invasion, the aggression. So the, the, the fact that there are some, and a few significant African countries that abstain, 
for their own reasons. They didn't, they didn't necessarily have to paint a picture that in some way or other Africa is indifferent to what is going on. We have every reason to be very, very uh, 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 not so much skeptical, but be very sensitive to great power movements, whether it is that of the Americans or Russians or Chinese, because invariably we are the the uh, the on the receiving end of such movements. So we need always to be very much on our guard. And I think that the majority of the, of the leaders in Africa and the states were, have been very clear consistently. I think that yesterday well, there, was a, there was yet another motion in which we supported uh, the, the condemnation of the alleged annexation of, uh, of, uh, of parts of, of, of Ukraine by Russia. Uh, so consistently, the majority of the states in Africa have been very alert to the issues that this war represents. Yes, they have also uh, their own uh, uh, relations with Russia, some of it very positive. Uh, and they also have their own reservations about much of uh, the so-called Western uh, uh, policy interventions on the continent. So uh, we have got a schmuzzle of things that, 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 that are on our table, and we're having to deal with it like any, any set of leaders have to deal with problems, not one by one, but all together at the same time, trying to find a way and trying to establish a balance as to what is the best interest that, that all of this ha has for us. But, um, uh, I mean, for instance, the, 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 the aspirations for a democratic future are still very strong in Africa. Yes, even despite some of the, the events that have taken place in Burkina Faso and in Guinea and in Mali recently, the population is still very keen on returning to democratic values and democratic institutions. And I think across the continent, there is uh, a recognition that uh, ruling ourselves as democracies is the most intelligent way we can to, uh, uh, address issues of governance and of development in our world. So, yes, we have our own reservations about mu much of policies that emerge from this part of the world, but there are also some shared values and, and interests that, that bind us. This is why, for many, the European-African dialogue, and, and it happened earlier this year and a few years ago also in Abidjan, where the leaders on both sides met, is a very important forum for being able to de determine what are those commonalities that would enable us to be able to make intelligent policy for both sides of the divide. It's just the Mediterranean that separates Africa from Europe. The Mediterranean is one of the smallest seas in the world, so it's literally uh, a slip of water that separates us. And then we have the centuries of, uh, of, of colonial interaction. Uh, so many institutions in our part of the world are governed by European uh, values and concepts and institutional arrangements. Uh, so th there's, a, there's a whole, the cultural exchanges, there's a whole balance of things that makes it possible for us to have a really meaningful dialogue across the slip of water with Europe. And, and um, whichever way you look at it, it has to be, probably in geopolitical terms, the most important relationship that we in Africa can have for obvious reasons. Yes, China and the rest are there. But the issues of, of, of proximity, of geography, of history, uh, of culture make it also imperative that we have a very focused uh, dialogue and very focused interaction with people in Europe. You're going to have to let me move I am on the basis of I am going to have to let you that. go right now, otherwise we'll be stuck in the Paris traffic. Thank you so much, Mr. President. <laughs>